if I think if I could give people one thing, it would be curiosity. This is From Paint to Purpose, a podcast by FCP Services, where we believe people drive growth. Exploring topics related to company culture, leadership, and construction industry insights. Now your host. Welcome, everybody. Today we have a People Ops Roundtable with Carol. Thank you, Carol. Hi, Danny. How's it going? <laughs> good, good. Okay, so um, we're going to be talking about HR and recruiting today. One of the bigger struggles is recruiting in 2021 after COVID and um, it being a lot of jobs, but not a lot of applicants. What can you tell us about that, Carol? I think that uh, if I actually had the answers to all of those things, um, I would be able to make a whole lot of money at the moment because people have a lot of ideas of what's actually happening, but we really are not clear. We do know that there are certain sectors of jobs uh, that are having a really tough time. So like the food industry, uh, the trades, uh, those type of thing. Uh, so we're just in a really unprecedented time. I kind of hate to use that because everybody uses that. Um, but we really have never seen anything quite like that because I have been in recruitment for many, many years, and I've never seen the flatness of recruitment to last as long as it has because you've always been able to do something a little bit different and make it work. But this time you're just having to scramble and try and do things that that don't work. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know exactly how to answer that. So maybe I should ask you that very same question because you're <laughs> fairly new to the recruitment world mm -hmm. within the last, what, five, seven years, something like that? Yeah. Tell me how you think it's different. Well, everything is definitely shifting um, from everything is going more into tech. So tech is a huge part of onboarding, screening. I mean, you know, they have this AI for free screening. Um, companies have that and um, they don't even talk to a recruiter until they're actually fully vetted. And it's a, it's a good tool to have for white collar jobs, but not blue collar. Because blue collar is a little more technical, you need to actually deep down and see if they actually know what to do. Yeah. And that just brings up another challenge because um, it'll kind of, in a way, I feel like it discriminates people that might not have the skills but want to get there. And it doesn't give them that opportunity. So um, it's a good thing and a bad thing just having <laughs> technology. Yeah. Um, yeah so... Um, well, I know... I got a question, though. Why do you think... Is it just the unemployment that is why it's so hard to recruit right now, or what, what is making this unprecedented? I think there's a whole variety of things. I think that we have a number of people who are available and looking for jobs. Um, but if you really try and evaluate what's been happening, they've been able to make a fairly good living between the unemployment and the extra money coming from the government. And now they really are looking for jobs that will be able to support them. And they're looking to companies to say, I need you to give me a job that will help me support my family. Uh, and many of those people are people that may not have finished their education or um, never really got a trade. So they never really had the opportunity. Because for years now, they've been saying, become, go into IT, go into technology, become a computer person, because that's the way to go, become a programmer. But not everybody's built that way. Like we have a person who works for us, highly technically logical uh, and great with fixing cars, right? Hands on. If you give him something hands on, he's, he's happy with it. So I think there's a whole variety of things. There's a shift in business. Uh, there's a shift in how we bring people. And I think that we're going to need to go back to what it used to be more corporate citizenship, right? So you have companies that will invest in their people, invest in the training, invest on bringing them in and helping them to actually move up the ladder financially, education-wise. So I think that there's a lot going on right at the moment. And that I think that when we can get a bead on it and how we can help people, because I don't know about you, but don't you think people have become more suspicious of us as recruiters? Are you going to get back to me? Am I ever going to hear from you again? Do you really care about me? Are you just trying to fill a job? 
And that goes back to core values, you know, making them feel welcome from the very beginning, from the moment that you start talking to them until you've completed your interview process with them. So I don't know. Any Spe- ideas? Speaking of interview processes, I know a lot of our um, on um, pre-screening and recruiting has to become virtual. <laughs> Let's talk about virtual um, pre-screening and stuff. What, when you're in person, um, you can look at the person and kind of measure, you know, their ability, the way they, their, their body language, but you can't do that with technology. So how do you make sure you cover everything you want to know about an employee um, and a recruit? And um, how do you make sure that you hire the right person when it's virtual? Again, I think you have to become very talented at picking up those subtle cues, change in color on their face, uh, the change in in dilation of their eyes when they're speaking to you. Do they look down and to the left? Do they look up and to the right? Um, do they kind of avoid looking at the camera? Are they fidgeting? But it's very difficult because as a recruiter, one of the things that's always been great is that you could bring people in and you could watch them from the moment that they walked in the door mm-hmm. until they actually sat at your desk to have a conversation with them. And you could pretty much tell what they were going to be like. And now you can't do that. Obviously, if they're late to the Zoom meeting, <laughs> that becomes an issue, right? Mm-hmm. But you, I think you have to be more adept at asking questions and really listening and asking a deeper question. And that's something that you do really well. You'll hear something and you go, tell me more about that. Mm-hmm. Where does that come from? Is that instinct for you or? Instinct and curiosity. It's more curiosity. I just want to know about this person, you know, their oh, learning style. Good. It just helps me if I see that they are a good recruit or they have good potential. I try to see what um, skills are lacking so I can help them grow and create a de- training development plan for Correct. them so we can make sure we're, they're fully supported. If I think if I could give people one thing, it would be curiosity. Mm-hmm. And that is when you're actually talking to people, if you can find out if they're curious about what you do or curious about the company, they've actually done their due diligence and their homework, that goes a long way as opposed to someone who's very passive and said, well, yeah, I just need a job. Can you get me a job? So, yeah, that's good. I like that. Curiosity is a good one. Yeah, yeah I'm wondering if we're going through a, a curiosity pandemic as far as when we have access to the whole world at our fingertips through our phones, nobody really wonders anything anymore. Mm-hmm. They, just, they just kind of look things up. And I, <laughs> I, I agree. I think curiosity is one of the key uh, attributes or characteristics for growth. Correct. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, how, do, how can somebody become more curious? Or would, how can somebody work on their curiosity? Wow. That's a really good question. That's I don't really know if you question. can teach that, but you can probably see what their interests are and start building from that. That's mm-hmm. how I would um, tackle that. Yeah, that shows up at every level, whether mm-hmm. you're doing a uh, performance review of someone and their work, Mm -hmm. and then you ask a very simple question and they go, well, I never thought of that. Mm -hmm. Well, you're doing the job. Right. At some point, don't you think you might want to take a class or figure that out? Um, I do think that we have hit a wall with people. They just think when you come in that everything is supposed to be handed to you on Mm -hmm. a platter. It's like, okay, now you need to take care of me. I kind of wonder if that isn't the way people were kind of brought up, though, everything was given to them before they need it. But you might be able to answer that a little <laughs> more than me. I think it's because of new generations. There's this mentality about um, everything is, that, like Danny said, everything's at your fingertips. So it's no longer, you no longer have to work for it in a way. It's just there. You can look for it on the Internet, which is free. And, you know, you can go on Facebook, you can go on LinkedIn, and you can find a whole bunch of information or anything you need at your fingertips. And that, I feel like it's made us a little bit lazy. <laughs> I think it's a desire not to learn. Mm-hmm. 
And I've watched, because with you, you do an immense amount of research on a topic. And you will search everywhere and talk to people and ask questions. Where do you get that curiosity? Where does that come from? Mine comes from wanting to grow and learn as much as I can. Um, there's there's a saying that, um, you know, they can take anything away from you except your education. So I feel like that's one of the biggest tools <laughs> in my life. So, And I'm just nosy, I guess I can say curiosity, you, um, whatever word you want to use. I just want to know about the world. I think... I do think that that's what's kept me in, in uh, recruitment and human resources for as long as I have, mm -hmm. is I love talking to people to figure out who they are, what they're actually hoping to achieve with their life, what their dreams are. I mean, what a great thing to be able to then be able to talk to them and say, yeah, I think we've got a path for you. I think we've got a mm -hmm. career path that will help you or go... I don't think this is going to be a good fit for you, but have you tried this? Mm -hmm. Or if you get an accountant who skydives, <laughs> what's what's the the difference? Normally, you don't want an accountant who skydives, right. right? And they're into extreme sports. How do you how do you justify those two things? So I think for me, it's been a puzzle of human beings, mm -hmm. and then figuring out how it fits with a manager with a department with a company, with an objective, with a strategy for the company or a strategy for that division. And it is, it's like a puzzle piece of, does it click, does it make it? It's like when we're hiring for our teams mm -hmm. and we talk about it all the time. We talk about, yeah. well, okay, no, he's not one for teaching, mm -hmm. but this person would be great because he could plug right in or this person would be really great with teaching. Mm -hmm. So it really is knowing your audience, knowing yeah. you've got to know both sides of the world. You've got to know the people that are hiring and the people that you are hiring. And the people to be working for. Yeah. That's why I think recruitment changes every day. And when you first get into recruitment, you think it's this, it's one thing. And then you discover later it's something so completely different and so amazing. And someone asked me. You know, why have you stayed in it as long as you have? And I go, because every once in a while, you change someone's life. Mm. Just a moment, you've changed their life. And, well, you don't change it, but they change it. But they, they're open to it, right? You get the assist. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Um, so, yeah, I think it's an amazing career, but it's changing very dramatically at the moment. I have a question as far as recruiting in general, because through my experience, whenever I went in to interview, I always felt this very one sided power dynamic. And, you know, I'm I want to impress the people that I'm talking with. I want to really sell myself. Mm. Um, and that was challenging. It was hard. I, I'm, like, how do you think the power dynamics have played into the current situation? Do you think um recruiters need to be like a little bit more meet meet you in the middle halfway with conversation and, and curiosity or sa even a sales pitch like i'm really trying to sell my company rather than having the other person come to you and say tell me why i should hire you you know is, do, you, do you think that a mentality shift needs to happen i'm curious how you guys think about that on being on the other side of the table um well, to be honest, we are also as nervous as you because we don't, you know, we want to represent the company well. We want to make sure they're being supported and we have everything they need to get hired. And um, I don't think there is a power dynamic. As an interviewer, as, as someone who's being um, interviewed, you do get nervous because you're like, this is a new job. These are going to be my bosses. But you also got to realize that it's another human on the other side and they're also nervous. You, they just don't show it or they've been long enough to, in their profession to know not to show anything and just stay neutral to get all the information you need from that person to make sure they're a correct hire for the company. That's how I see it. How do you see it, Carol? I think that we've gone from a time of, of where we really actually cared about the human beings across the table from us and that when I know when I – kind of came up in recruitment, we were trained extensively on how to place people, 
Uh, what do we look for? What are the general characteristics? Things that we talk about all the time. I kind of trained you a little bit on that as well, but you're not normal. We've discussed that many times. <laughs> and, and then all of a sudden there's been a shift because of technology and because the people sitting at a desk are not trained in recognizing that human resources requires human interaction and that sometimes that's a very challenging thing. And our worlds have become so small that we don't often think outside the box, like this is my job, tick the box. Okay, do they have, yes. Do they have this software? Yes. Do they have this? Some of that's handled with AI. Before they even get to you, they have to have certain words in the resume. And so what's happening is I believe that recruiters are becoming more transactional. So it depends on if they're a recruiter in a company or if they're a recruiter in a recruitment agency. And, dep and it depends on who's trained them. And if you have people that don't have a sense of human, it's just not going to work. It's like, okay, get this person and plug it in a hole. Get this person and plug it in a hole. But you can tell by the turnover. You can tell by a whole variety of things as to whether or not you're being successful. So I think it has to be more relational mm -hmm. and less about the transaction, no matter whatever that is. So I do think that people, again, it's about curiosity of those humans. You don't have a lot of time to make decisions. You have to fill jobs faster, quicker, because those people will be gone before you know it. Mm -hmm. So I do think there's a lot of things in play, but that's my opinion. It's become, instead of relational, transactional. Well, the re relational transactional also um, ties back to the mission of the company, right? If And the environment. If they're a numbers company and that they just want hours billed, for example, in a recruiting company, sure. you know, you have to fill that in order to keep your job. And so it does become transactional. But if there's a company where they actually care for the people, it's different. So you kind of have to adapt yourself as a recruiter to what the company wants and what they need. I think I've worked on both sides of the fence, right? Both within a human resource department and then as a high volume recruiter and an executive recruiter. And I will tell you when you take the time to slow down and when you treat people like humans, and you treat them the way that you wish to be treated, and you actually find what they want, that it goes a lot smoother, and that your placements are better, you're able to charge more money as a recruitment company because you have quality processes, and you can guarantee it as opposed to a churn and burn. So again, it, you're right, it goes back to the dollar and what your company's values are. And if they say, we're just gonna make it to 300 million this year, you have to be willing to do that. Um, so if it doesn't fit your personality, then you definitely don't want to be there if that isn't the kind of environment that you want to work in. I do think with the advent of video mm -hmm. that's coming up, we were talking a little bit about that this morning. Uh, TikTok now has uh, video resumes. Video resumes. Yeah, really? <laughs> mm -hmm. Which kind of goes against what I was trained to do, which mm -hmm. is you don't ever want a picture on a resume because people will judge you. Mm -hmm before you even get to the interview. They will judge you on your eye color or the color of your skin or how old you are mm -hmm. or if you dress in a certain way. How do you feel about that? I think it's beneficial to um, people that want to work in something that's um, artistic or um, like graphic design or I'm trying to think of specific titles, but like something that's artistic and it has to show your creativity side, it would be perfect for that. But I don't know if I can take someone, a CEO applying for a job seriously if they do it on a video, just because you're kind of, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about it. I, I don't agree with it right now. <laughs> Maybe it's a little old fashioned, um, but it goes back to what you said, you know, it, it, you do judge a person, you know, within the first two seconds of meeting them. And that just gives you either a leg up or, or no, um, what's the word? 
What's the opposite of leg up? Oh, disadvantage? <laughs> the disadvantage, uh, just, uh, yeah. sorry. I was like, I don't or know a you disadvantage. Are... It, you know, down. it depends on the people. <laughs> leg down, there you go. <laughs> yeah, so I feel like it could be a disadvantage or it can be an advantage, depending on what your position is and what you're applying for. What if you're not animated? <laughs> what if you're not a person who can really, you're mm -hmm. not a people person, you're an introvert? Mm -hmm. How is that going to come across? Yeah, it wouldn't come across good in the video. So that's why I, I feel like it it <laughs> it's going to depend on what your job is and what you're trying to yeah. achieve in your resume, I guess. Um, but then again, it worked for Legally Blonde. <laughs> so maybe it would work. That's Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I want to talk about something else. Uh, working remotely, you know, everybody's has moved um, to home offices and everything. Um how do you think we should be um, able to support them while they're, I don't know, a state away, two states away? I think you have to have the right people in the right place to begin with. Uh, are they accountable? Uh, are they available? Are they on the computer when you need them to be on the computer? But at the end of the day, it's about deliverables. And it actually requires your manager to be more in tune with exactly what kind of deliberal deliverables do you expect from your employees. And then you have to measure those. So it shouldn't matter if you work a 40 hour week or a 70 hour week. If your deliverables are quality deliverables and you're working from home, it shouldn't matter. And I think we're trying to measure the wrong things. And I do believe that the new generation coming up um, behind you even, <laughs> they really want that flexibility. Yeah. And I do believe that they want, um, as we all do, to be able to be trusted and that we should be able to know what their job is and to know what's expected of them and then to be able to measure that. Because if it's not being measured, then they're always going to come up short. They're always going to have someone questioning what they're doing while they're at home. And I think that's where generationally there are going to be some challenges because you're going to have managers who are older who are not going to like that because we all knew that we showed up early and we were the last ones out. We shut the lights off as we went away. Or even during the time of the tech boom, we slept under our desks because we couldn't leave our desk. It just didn't, it wasn't even possible. And it was just considered part of your job. Not so anymore. So I think going to remote work don't you think that you're going to have to be able to measure things? Yeah. Um, I think just being supported by your company um, is huge when working remotely. We had to work remotely for a couple months, and just that support made a huge difference, making sure you're connected with your employees, making sure you communicate with them so they're aware of everything that's going on. Yep. Um, you couldn't just walk up to the next door office and be like, hey, what's going on? So that communication and that support was huge and important um, for everyone because, um, you know, you have to keep your bosses in the loop of what's going on. Some details might fall in through the cracks if you don't. And that could cause a huge or bigger problem. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think the work remote is good for certain positions with certain for certain people at certain experience levels. But Correct. I think about how much I learned at my first job out of college. And I was like, I felt like in the first two weeks, I learned more at that job <laughs> than I did in the previous four years. Correct. And I don't get that experience. or I don't learn that if I'm pigeonholed at my desk at home. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about there's something about being in proximity with mm -hmm. people that are far, you know, they're, whether you want to label them as a mentor or not, you can sponge up a lot when you're just around mm -hmm. um, people that, have, that are farther down the path. And so I think we've heard a lot of great things about work from home, but those are mainly, I think, from the people that um, have, have that experience and have already developed right. those skills. And I think for Gen Zers, I would be nervous to want to start my career out from home because mm -hmm. now it's going to create so much more work for me to go and learn from people for free. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So and, and in certain positions, customer service, um, some some positions you just have to be on the clock. Right. Yeah. Like Correct. you just have to be there, and when someone calls Correct. in, someone needs to pick up. Right. So 
I think this work from home thing gets really um, grouped like a little bit too broadly. Mm-hmm. And I think that's that might be hurting the recruitment efforts in general. Do you, th- do you guys think that like too many people have false expectations of what a company should be these days? Yes. Oh, yes. Definitely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're getting more and more odd things that that feel are, are as an just entitlement. So <laughs> weird about expectations of what you as an employer should be doing for the employee. But I think mm-hmm. that that comes from years of corporations saying, I need you to do this for me, mm-hmm. as opposed to this is a symbiotic relationship. And I think the companies or the corporations that have learned how to strike that balance will probably do better. Mm-hmm. Take a look at some of the bigger companies who shall remain nameless. They had all kinds of labor issues. They had all kinds of, and this is more than just one company. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and they just kept taking and taking and taking. And at one point they went, oh, okay. Maybe we do need to pay more money. Maybe we do need to have better benefits. Maybe we need to talk about child care because this is a balance. And that mm-hmm. goes back to that corporate citizenship that I was talking about. I do think that uh, that's one of the things that we are going to have to look at for the future. Really important. And the other one is I also think that we need to take a look and take a page from the past. Mm-hmm. And the page from the past was back back in the day <laughs> uh, when you didn't have people that had the skill set, which is what's happening right now. We have a lot of people, but they don't have the skill set for certain jobs. And what we did was we actually had to build them. We had to build people. So that's where you take the people that have the personality, the drive, the desire, the curiosity Mm -hmm. to say, just put me in coach, I'll do a great job for you. Mm -hmm. And then you invest in them by creating a training program And then through that training program, being able to help them learn a skill. There weren't a lot of software programmers back in the day, right? There weren't a lot of of people that could do computer networking. um, There were all kinds of jobs that people didn't know anything about because it was brand new. Uh, And so they went about training people and investing in people and investing in getting people who uh, were long-term unemployed into an employment situation. But that's where the government, so the county and city governments worked with corporations and said, Mm -hmm. we'll give you a tax break if you'll provide training for these particular people. And here are the quotas that you need to train. Mm -hmm. And it worked. It was great. It just brought people up and things really started to boom because there were no people. Kind of similar to what's going on now, although right now it's quite odd. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we're really going to have to focus on training. I know that for our company, we're really looking at a way to how do we bring people in who have the raw talent and ability mm-hmm. and teach them a career in painting. Mm-hmm. How do we do that? And project management and construction. And those are even harder to fill than IT positions. What was your question? I forgot. Oh, okay. That was fun. <laughs> okay, again. Okay. Um, I have one was, question. Go for it. Unless you want it. Yes. I forgot the question. Okay. It was blue collar, but go ahead. <laughs> How do you think... Um, what, or, let's see here. Cut that out, Danny. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> as far as hiring new employees and thinking a little bit outside of the box... I've thought of, like, there's two different ways that um, that come to mind as far as outside the traditional path of just the at will signing on the dotted line. Okay, here's the employee. One would be to do more of a trial period up front, say two, three, four week trial period. Or on the other side of the extreme would be take a page out of major league playbook where it's you sign a three year contract for X amount and then you can, it's less risky to develop that employee. Do either of those approaches seem like they could be something that would work in your industry? Um, I can tell you by personal experience that we're gonna give you a two week trial. 
I felt undervalued. Um, it happened to me as a um, when I was applying for recruiting positions. They had told me they were going to hire me for two weeks, and they were still going to hire for the position even though I was hired for it. But I was going to be in a trial period. It felt like I was being devalued. So um, it's not fair to a human to treat them that way. It's either, hey, you are going to be, will you have the right personality? You fit in with the company, and we'll train you because you're that human, or you're not. I feel like that's a little black and white. It can't, there can't be gray area. And um, with the two week trial, I think that's in the gray area. <laughs> what about you? I think that's a generational thing, okay. right? I mm -hmm. think the idea of actually signing someone to a three year contract, you can sign a contract all day long and I, you can't keep people from getting another job because they want to advance their career. And if you don't have the kind of company, if it's flat structured mm -hmm. and there's only one foreman or there's only one manager in that particular division, then they have to be willing to stay there. It's kind of a bureaucratic mentality. So I, I don't believe that that's going to work in this day and age. I just don't think so, unless it's a really fantastic job mm -hmm. that pays really well with great benefits and a great future and saying, look, we want you to commit to our company. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think with the mentality of what's happening now, we can't get people to commit to a job <laughs> for a season. You know, that, that, that's, a, that's a challenge. That's a challenge. But that's a good question. Is it, do you think, um, I remember my question. Um, do you think that's because of a, like a blue collar, like stigma, I guess you can say that, with the new generations, it's not glamorous like IT is? That's a really good question. I do think working with your hands may not be as valued as it used to be, right. which is kind of silly mm -hmm. because those are the positions that are really needed. And for people who don't like to be in a class setting, that's probably the best way to go, although more and more. Even with the trades, there's a huge amount of training that goes into that. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the laws? What kind of uh, respirators do you use? Um, if you're using an air hammer, do you have to wear a particular kind of earmuffs? Um, so there's a lot that goes into it that I think we're just leaving a whole bunch of people out of. Mm -hmm. And that's my concern is that people are just giving up. Mm -hmm. They're just giving up and saying, I don't know what I want to do. Just give me something to put together and I can do it. So that, you know, that's a really deeper question for people who are a lot smarter than I am. Right. But I do think mm -hmm. that uh, there's a stigma to being a tradesperson. Mm -hmm. But man, they make a heck of a lot of money. <laughs> One of our uh, project managers just bought a new home. And he came in and he said, man, if I had known years ago, I'd have just become a plumber. Because <laughs> he had to call a plumber, and it it just cost him a fortune to mm -hmm. get one thing done in his house. And he says, should have become a plumber. It's really simple. We were talking about um, an electrician that went in for retraining and the recertification. Mm. Can you tell us a little more about that, and why do you think that's happening? Yes, that was a fascinating conversation. He it was a, 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 an electrician, has been an electrician for years, and every couple of years they have to go in and actually take a test and become recertified for any of the new changes. Uh, and, and when he went in, he's in his 50s, late 50s, and he said, I've only got just a few more years left before I retire. And he says, well, I walked into this hall. There were 80 people in the hall, and all but four of the people were over the age of 50. He goes, we are in serious trouble at this point if we can't replace those other, what is it, 73 people, 74 people, something like 76 oh, people. No. So, and that was here in Minnesota. So I do think that we're coming to a bit of a crisis of who's going to be doing these things and how do we fill the gaps. I also know that I was very fortunate to work in a program where we took people who were underemployed and people who were at 200% of poverty or below, and we created a comprehensive retraining program which pulled in all the resources from different parts of the world, right? So 
housing to get people set into their home before they can worry about getting a job, uh, child care, any issues such as substance abuse or if their children were really ill or had a mental illness, how do we take care of that? And then you create this web of safety and security around them. You then provide the education and training through the grants that are available and through the training programs of things that you might not have ever thought that that person would do. You find out someone has an incredible aptitude for numbers and they go into non-destructive ND, I forgot what it's called, NDT training. And they suddenly have a job at the end of a one and a half years at 80000 a year. Well, in their life, they never could have imagined that. Or someone who discovered that they had a talent for computer programming, but because we were able to take all the social services that were available, create that web around them to take care of their daily needs, he's now doing magnificent things. And you see him on Facebook, he's bought a home and his kids are thriving and his family is thriving. So I think we need to really take a look at this as a much bigger issue. You know, how do we work together with industry, education, social services, and actually come together to create a solution to use all those funds and all those brain trusts out there to say there's a better way to do this. We have to acknowledge that Poverty wreaks havoc with a person's self-esteem and how they go about applying for a job, how they keep a job. So I, I think that this is such a complex issue. And we as HR people, uh, we deal with it all day, every day. Mm -hmm. And you look at people that have such promise and you just want to just, you don't know whether to hug them or smack them. You know, it's <laughs> just, don't smack anybody. It's illegal. But uh, <laughs> I, I think that, there's just so much that goes into this. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I think I got off talk, topic, but I think it's important that we really yeah. acknowledge this is a much bigger issue than this room, mm -hmm. this company, this idea. There is a way that we can actually make a difference, but we as a society and as a group of people are going to have to come together and say, we got to do it differently. How do we do that? So do you think, um, like bigger companies that are billion dollar companies would benefit from a structure that's like takes care of an employee in a mass loves hierarchy kind of way. For example, Amazon, I recently read mm -hmm. that the retention is above a hundred percent. Like if they were to implement something like that, do you think that would help them with the retention and help them grow and help society? I think that companies are going to have to to do that. And I don't think it's just going to be the behemoth companies. Okay. I think the small mom and pops are going to have to come at it a little bit differently in those medium sized companies, because that's where the impact is the most. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we do need to acknowledge that if you have someone who can't show up to work on a regular basis, because of substance abuse, or because of something else, you really need to address it in a, right. in a different way, mm -hmm. rather than continuing to punish them I think there has to be a more humane way to do that. So how do we find that balance between humane and running a business? <laughs> um, I feel like that's one of the hardest parts. Part. <laughs> right? I think we have to lead from a service perspective. And I think that we do that really well. When we talk to people, we're just not interested in why they didn't show up to work. We really are interested what's behind that. Mm -hmm. And if they run into trouble, we do everything in our power mm -hmm. to assist them to make a better decision. But sometimes at the end of the day, no matter how much it pains you, you say, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. this can't continue. So I do think that we do that on a smaller scale. I would love to find a way to actually engage with people at a level where they recognize if this is not a good relationship, none of us win. Mm -hmm. None of us win. So, I mean, you, you're both part of the younger generation. What do you look for? In a company? In a company or in a recruitment process. You, you talked about how one-sided it was. Talk to that a little bit if you two were to recognize that that person was transactional and you were trying to build a relationship with them. 
how might you do that? Well, I definitely found a lot more success once I stopped putting the business or the interviewer on a pedestal. And I actually came from a different perspective of do I like I'm going to interview this company on if it's a good place for me to work, if I agree with their direction, their mission, their vision. And it's crazy how I started getting um, app, or, um, offers once I came from that perspective rather than more of a desperation type. I want a job. I need a job. Um, so personally, I looked at every job I've really taken in my 20s is will this help me move in the direction of one day owning my own business? Mm. And so I didn't necessarily, I mean, obviously you, you, you love to have a nice paycheck and have good benefits and that sort of thing. But that probably wasn't priority number one for me. Priority number one was, do I feel like I can grow here? Do I feel like I can learn something from the people around me here? Mm. And, um, yeah, that's that's what I was really tuned in on when I was interviewing. So whether that's good or not, and I was upfront in a lot of those interviews that said one day I want to own my own business. Um, and I don't know if that turned people off or it turned people on in the sense that, okay, this guy has an entrepreneurial spirit. Mm -hmm. He'll probably be a self-starter in our organization. We'll partner with him for three, five years, whatever, and then... If it's time for us to part ways, we'll part ways. So I think that was a pretty healthy approach. You know, mm -hmm. it wasn't marriage, but, um, <laughs> you know, it was long term. I, I think that brings up a really good thing about agility of an organization. Mm -hmm. right? So let's talk about that for just a minute. You just hit so many spots right there <laughs> that were generational in nature. Mm -hmm. And I believe that that's what recruiters are dealing with. So what do you do when you're a, a generation? like that you heard what he said you mm -hmm. identify with that mm -hmm. right yep <laughs> because it's you you've said that now what do you do when you have the generation behind you coming up and they have a completely different focus of well i'll come to you but only if it benefits me period that's a tough one um i haven't really looked into the future in that kind of way um i i don't know how to answer that right now because it is about agility. Uh -huh. how, do, how does a company get the kind of agility that's necessary to adapt to the different needs of the people? Mm -hmm. And I do think that the bigger companies are going to have a hard time with that. Right? Yeah. I could be well, wrong. Well, that's one side of the equation. The other side would be Gen Z is going to have a rude awakening that the world doesn't bend to their every need and desire. That is true. I so don't know. Gonna... I mean, is everyone going to be a TikTok star? No. Or at some point, are they going to have to make some money on their own and figure out, oh, the world actually, I have to contribute something of value. Um, and it has to be a give and take. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not trying to put Gen Z on blast. but <laughs> I think they're going to fall and figure it out. <laughs> and, actually, um, I think they'll, they'll be the ones who'll come up with, you know, I think there's a better way to build a mousetrap. Yeah, figure, figuring stuff out. I think um, their curiosity is going to prevail. I, get, I think so. I mean, look at I've that. Seen, I've seen it, like, with my sisters. They, yeah. They're 16, oh my goodness, yeah. they're 14, and they have pop-up businesses. You know, um, they learn about entrepreneurship and businesses through LinkedIn, um, TED Talks. I send them all that stuff, and their curiosity just keeps going, and, they, and they, their mentality is, well, if you can do it, I can do it, but I can do it better. <laughs> So figuring it out and stuff, um, I think that's going to help them a lot in that curiosity. How does that help the corporation or the company? They're going to be adaptable and flexible. And um, I feel like sometimes we it's scarce um, because you get a lot of people that are not used to change. You know, it's a company, same structure and all that mm -hmm. stuff. And if that shifts, then for them all hell breaks loose you know it's like everything's changing freak out and stuff and with this flexibility i think they'll be able to adapt to those changes that's my opinion <laughs> i'm really excited to see how things are going to change and even now i find myself kind of like a 
prairie dog or a meerkat, you know, kind of coming up going, okay, there's an opportunity here. There's an opportunity to do it differently. There's an opportunity to find a way, just like we did before, going, okay, how do we adapt to this? How do we make this different? I just wish it would come faster. Well, let let me ask you a question. How did you adapt to all these new computers and technology coming into the workforce? Oh, it's awesome. (laughs) It was just the most fantastic thing ever because we could do more with less. Mm -hmm. And it was frustrating in the beginning. But, oh, my goodness, the things that we can do, we couldn't even have dreamt of it back then. Mm -hmm. You know, when you... I told you about the time that I lost a database with 10,000 employees in it and because an Excel spreadsheet totally imploded because there weren't a lot of databases. Access had just come out, Fox Pro, there were a couple others, but companies hadn't quite shifted to that yet. And that was probably the closest thing to a heart attack I've ever had. You know, when you work for a very large corporation and you're responsible for the data for 10,000 people, <laughs> it just went up in smoke and it was a brand new job. And mm-hmm. I knew that that was going to be an issue, but I didn't expect it to be an issue in the first week. It was like, right. bang. <laughs> so, and we finally started backing up data. <laughs> it was on a thing about this big and about <laughs> this thick, but it didn't take very much data. And now, <laughs> just a little, you've got well, it, or it's in the cloud, now. or it's in... Um, so I don't know. I just find it exciting. I love technology. And I think the more that technology can do for us, um, the better. The more we can focus on what we actually like to do. <laughs> That's a, how I see With it. a proviso. Right. Because <laughs> yeah. there are some things that I find a little scary. Mm-hmm. Because I'm not sure how we as humans are going to be able to adapt the technology that is running faster than we are. Yeah. We haven't had the evolutionary change yet to be able to have our brains adapt to a lot of that. So that'll yeah. be interesting. Very. But how <laughs> Especially exciting. With AI. Oh, I love it. I am all for technology. If I can um, automate any stuff, I will. I'm all for it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, I think we're just going to get more and more of that. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I, I think that it's we're going to have to. Mm-hmm. We're going to have to. Yeah. Yeah, it's a fun time to be alive. Definitely. A lot of change. But a lot of opportunity. <laughs> Anything else you guys want to discuss? Anything else on your mind? Um, not for the moment, but we're definitely going to do this again. I like this. <laughs> I like the uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. I just think that there's so much potential and possibility right now that we just have to find the key to the door. Mm-hmm. We just have to find the key to the door, and that sense of curiosity. Um, the sense of actually caring about humans and how they operate in the world and how we can actually achieve the goals of our business is huge. But we all got to work together. It doesn't matter whether you're a boomer, an Xer, a millennial, or a or a Z, right? Mm-hmm. Or the one that's coming up after that. <laughs> uh, we're going to have to work together to solve some of these issues. Yeah. Well said. Yep. I agree. Well, Carol, thank you. Danny, thank you. Appreciate thank you. it. This was a very, very interesting and thought-provoking <laughs> episode. I really appreciate taking the time to do this with me. Thank you. Absolutely. It was great. Thank you. Thank yep. you. Thanks for listening. To learn more, visit fcpservices.com. Until next time, remember, people drive growth.